Welcome in to another episode of Your Drone Questions Answered, brought to you by Drone Launch Academy. I'm your host, Chris Brelove. Today, the question we're going to tackle is, how are drones used in crash and crime scene reconstruction? So to help us answer this question, I'm really excited to welcome into the show my colleague at Duncan Parnell, Calvin Riker. Calvin, thanks for joining the show. It's my pleasure, sir. Thank you for having me. No, man, I'm excited. So if you would just kind of kick us off with your background in law enforcement in this space in particular, and we'll kind of jump into it more from there. So I started law enforcement in 1997 with a local sheriff's office here in South Carolina, Saluda County. And then two years later, I transitioned to the highway patrol here in South Carolina. And within about five years of being on the highway patrol, I was able to join our full-time collision reconstruction team. And I stayed there until my retirement. So I got about 17 years with the collision reconstruction side as a full-time job with the highway patrol um, up to my retirement with coming on to Duncan Parnell. Awesome. So I can imagine with 17 plus years in this space, Calvin, the tools, the approaches, the technology, I can only imagine evolved tremendously. When you first got into that space, were you guys using point and shoot photography? Where, where does it start? And then at what point did drones really kind of enter into the mix? It's evolved just a, a smidgen, as we would say. With like documentation, we started actually with pulling 100 foot tape. That's what I learned in the academy. And that evolved to using a total station with multiple data collectors to document these scenes up to my retirement where we're using GNSS equipment. Going back to the photography side, we started out with 35 millimeter film. I remember, you know, we'd stick three or four or five you know, 24 exposure in our side pocket and, and shoot away at a, at a scene. And then we finally, you know, transitioned to digital cameras, which we thought was, you know, now we can take as many pictures as we want. And then we got into, you know, using drones to help with that documentation as well. And I will say in the transi transition with using drones, we would actually sometimes, depending on the scene, contact our state law enforcement division who had like a, you know, real helicopter. And we would get up into the helicopter and actually lean out the side of it and document scenes as well. The drones really help save a lot of money, you know, not to jump ahead, but, you know, instead of calling out a helicopter, using those resources. That's incredible. So something you said, you mentioned obviously total stations, pulling tape, whatever. So is it fair to say that a picture's worth a thousand words, but it's not merely seeing context? I mean, you guys... And as an investigation proceeds, you need to make very accurate and precise measurements, right? From the, from the ortho mosaic or whatever. This is not just a, a relative, oh, we see an element here or a piece of debris there. So accuracy is, a, is of paramount importance, correct? Well, I think you have two different avenues you can look at it with. And one would be, if we're just looking for an overhead shot just to give reference, then yes, you can throw the drone up and, and take care of that in a, in a short amount of time. But if you're going to use that for any type of analysis with deciding what measurements are or what angles are, and that's going to be used to potentially take away somebody's, you know, civil liberties, then there's a little bit more that goes into that process. I've always approached it in those two different avenues. And when I speak to people, I'm like, you just want to throw it up and just get an overhead shot just for context, just for aesthetic purposes. That's a different conversation than what I'm usually talking about when we're, you know, using it for analysis and measurements and angles and putting that ultimately product in a court of law to determine guilt or innocence or in a civil type court setting. Absolutely. So dispatch comes in and I don't know if maybe these are like specialized teams that aren't the first on the scene, but... Take me through just maybe a typical scene of how one gets to that point. All right, we're launching the drone now to document, I guess it could be a crash or a different crime scene, but what's kind of a typical order of operations to that, if that question makes sense? So I can relate to what we did on the highway patrol and then, you know, since retiring and we're now we're training people, I, I've seen a lot of different approaches to it. We were a full-time unit and there was different criteria that we got called out. Sometimes it was immediate response based on the call. And then sometimes it was a deferred response where we would go out the next business day. But once we got out there, we usually had kind of like a standard operating guidelines that we went by. Most of our cases, especially at the end of my career, we always flew the drone if airspace allowed that, if, if the weather allowed that, and the conditions. So that approach was kind of set in stone by our, our command staff on how we do it. Now transitioning to the training and teaching, I start to see that it seems to be a little bit more an officer's decision once they get there. Hey, we going to need the drone for this or we're not going to need the drone for this. And then they will make that determination with, I guess, the rest of the guys on the scene to determine 
if they're going to do that or not. So we would document all of that. And then we would lay out ground control point targets throughout our scene to make sure that when we process these images later and whatever photogrammetry software you would be using for us, it was Pix4D. Then we would have scale factors placed within our scene to make sure that it was scaled correctly. Because if we have time, I can get into a case where we used to not do that process. And it was a humbling experience in court. You know, I've kind of used that as a passion to teach and train since that's happened to me. But once we'd lay down those ground control points, then we would document that either in the beginning, we were still using total stations, but at the end of our career, we were transitioning to GNSS systems to help clear that scene more quickly because that's the ultimate goal. We want to make sure we document all the evidence, but we want to try to get the roadway open up as quick as possible because we know that there's a lot of secondary effects that happen the longer that road is shut down. And then at some point we would fly that drone. And I'll say this, Chris, there's sometimes that people above us would make decisions that, hey, we've got to get this road open. We've laid down the ground control points. We've documented them with GNSS or total station, and we would just have to leave and then come back at a later date and time when, you know, traffic wasn't quite as bad, reset our ground control points, fly the drone, and then, you know, use that for our documentation purposes. So that didn't happen a lot, but that has happened. Yeah. What about nighttime? How do you guys deal with that? Is there other spotlights you bring in? Do you have to fly with the spotlight attachment on the drone? How do y'all deal with that? Or do you just wait, hey, it's three in the morning, let's spray, spray paint, and then just come back at, at sunrise. How do y'all deal with the lack of light in many cases? So depending on how much lighting we had, we sometimes did throw up a drone and just get those cursory kind of overhead looks. We never did like a mapping mission at night. We would always, as you just said, spray paint it, try to get back out there at, at the closest possible time after the incident, and then fly the drone during daylight hours so that we make sure that we could see the evidence that we actually needed to have for our documentation. We never did a map emission at night, for lack of better terms. We would throw them up just to document what we could see with the drone, but nothing that we would use for processing at a later date and time. Yeah, that figures. Do other techniques like terrestrial laser scanning, things like that, maybe become the tool of choice if appropriate when you're like, man, this is 3 a.m., this is a busy road. We're not sure we can actually get out here. Is that part of it as well? It's a hybrid approach, right? What's the right tool for the job? Is that correct? Yes. It's making sure you had the right tool for the job. Unfortunately, on the patrol, we never had a scanner to actually utilize in those types of situations. And that would have been a great option, especially in nighttime scenes or in times when you couldn't fly the drone because of weather, if it was raining or, you know, whatever. We just didn't have that chance. We would have to document it the best we could and then come back out at a later date and time to make sure that we captured that data that we needed to. Let's pivot briefly. What about crime scene? And I don't know if you've got a particular example in mind that you could speak to, but just t walk us through that. How could a drone be used or how are they used sometimes for those sorts of scene reconstructions? A lot of people, you know, we think about, I call it the A word because I don't like saying the word, but a collision or a crash. They don't think of those as actually crimes, but every one of those are crimes. But if you're looking at the typical assault and battery or murder type case, if it happens outdoors, their processes are the same. The application is a little different, right? You're looking at different approaches as to the investigation, but you're still out there documenting evidence. You're wanting a scale diagram based on that evidence. And then you're using the drone to help document that instead of pulling tape or using a laser to determine distances. Now you can use that in conjunction with the drone and the data that you collect on the ground to make sure that you've got the best product you can for court purposes or, or whatever that final result is. Now that, that makes sense. So let me ask this, the actual acquisition, does this mirror what many folks are used to for, let's say a pretty standard mapping mission flown with like a DJI M3E? Or are there differences in flight altitude and desired GSD and overlap and things of that nature that might, might deviate from quote unquote normal mapping? I would say the normal would be set your box around your instant area, make sure that you're flying a double grid mission and you hit playing, you, you know, you're watching the drone, making sure that it doesn't end up in a treetop or somewhere. There are investigators that are a little bit more advanced that will do manual missions in fly to make sure that, you know, that's the way they want to document their scenes. But I would say a majority of the time, we always just kind of made it a standard here in South Carolina, hundred feet. We were usually good hundred to 125 feet is where we tried to stay at in flying on missions. But yeah, we would want to use a double grid mission because we were wanting to do a model of that scene. And then we just drew a box 
around that area and hit the play button. And that's kind of like the easy button, right? Instead of just manually flying it, you hit play and then you watch it and then wait for it to land and then capture your data or transfer your data from that point. Absolutely. So, okay. So what happens now? I mean, are you punching it through PIX4D, React Reactormatic or whatever? Are you combining it with some other maybe on-scene data? How do folks get to deliverable? Maybe something that's being used as evidence, even in, in, the, in the court or whatever the case may be. So we would take our CAD program and pour it in our either total station data or our GNSS data, and we would get the either lat long or XYZ data. And then we would put that into like the ground control point manager in PIX4D. Then we would use the process in PIX4D and identify where those points at, were at in the pictures. And then we would let that process. And then we would take that data, bring it back into our CAD program and making sure that it aligns with our ground control points and then any checkpoints that we had shot during, you know, that scene as well. So that's the down and dirty, you know, making sure that we had GCPs laid out correctly and then use the GPC data into PIX4D in the ground control point manager tab. And then I will say this, Chris, that when I've done that a hundred percent of the time, I've gotten perfect results coming out of PIX4D. When I can tell you before we were using a different method that, you know, was taught to us that ended us up not getting a hundred percent accurate data, which was, you know, like I said earlier, was a very humbling experience. Yeah. No, I hear you. And the stakes are much higher for you guys. Um, for folks in the law enforcement community who might be listening to this, but what about for folks who are drone service providers, maybe starting their own business or have been doing that for a while? Do you see any opportunity for, you know, civilian non-law enforcement or non-retired law enforcement folks to actually offer this service in partnership with anyone else who might be in this, in this space? Is that even a possibility? No, it definitely is a possibility. And, and I will give you an example. My captain who retired and started his own reconstruction company in the beginning and, and still to date does not have his, you know, 107 license. And so he's contracting out to a local guy that has a drone, has his license and has, you know, software that and he'll come out to these scenes and he'll process them with my captain and then he'll give him the data. So there is an opportunity for people to get, I think it's more on the private side and not the public side. I think most law enforcement agencies are going to have somebody internal to do that because of the sensitive information they're dealing with. But on the private side, more on the civil side of the business, not the criminal side, I think there's definitely an opportunity for somebody to be able to assist a reconstructionist that doesn't have a, a drone nor the license the hardware software to help with that for sure. But like I said, on the public side, on the law enforcement side, when you're looking at criminal charges, I think it's just a different arena that you're playing in. And I think they just try to keep that all in-house. Yeah. For the larger drone community, there is an opportunity there. And if they've already got the kit, the equipment, like you said, the software and the know-how, they could really be an asset into these processes. So that's awesome. Maybe the last thing I'll ask from you is just so folks who are interested in any of this, learning more. It could be law enforcement, could be folks who want to be that kind of subcontractor. What's the best way for them to reach out to you and, and make contact? Yes, yeah, so they can just uh, Google. We, Duncan Parnell just launched their new website. I think it's actually today. Um, but if they type in Duncan Parnell Public Safety, it'll take them to a web page. And mine and my coworker, Daniel Detweiler's picture and LinkedIn information, along with our email address, is uh, located at the bottom of that page. So they can reach out to either one of us and we'll help them any way that that we can. Awesome. Well, thanks for that. We'll also make sure to throw in that link and maybe your LinkedIn link directly. Calvin, again, thank you so much for jumping up. But for folks listening, thank you as always. If you've got a question like this to tackle on this podcast, please, on the Drone Launch Connect community, ydqa.io, or shoot me an email at chris at dronelaunchacademy.com. Until next time, be safe out there. Take care.